So 7.02, May 20th, start the school modernization committee meeting. Just come off mute for a minute so that Arnett can do roll call. Okay. Ms. B? Here. Mr. Bowman is here. Here. Mr. Gussenberg is here. Ms. Harrigan is here. Here. Chair, Chairwoman Kemp. Here. Mr. Martelli. Mr. Here. Martinez. Here. Mr. Mr. Neff. Miss, there he is. Ms. Nichols. Mr. Pangaro. Here. Not here. Mr. Perugini. Here. Is I don't oh there you are. Hi. Hi, Mrs. Palm Tree. Uh <laughs> Mr. Talbot. Here. And Mr. Walsh. Here. You have a quorum. Okay. okay. All right, we will stand for the pledge then. Um, it. There it is. There it is. I pledge allegiance to nope, the flag of the United, United States, States of America. United States of America. And to the Republic. To the Republic. For which it stands, stands one nation, nation under, God, under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible liberty, indivisible, and justice liberty and justice for all. For all. <laughs> Perfectly timed. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> <No problem>. Okay. <laughs> First order of business approval. Looking for approval from our May 4th uh, meeting minutes, please. So moved. Second. Peter, I mean, Chuck, thank you all in favor, or I'll say anybody not in favor or anybody abstaining. Are you abstaining, John? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. Your hand is frozen on my screen, so I just want to make sure. <laughs> all right. No. <Nah. laughs> All right, so um, the first kind of order of business, we are going to have the presentation. Um, Rich is going to take us through a presentation from the teacher staff input subcommittee. Um, this committee, as, as Rich will explain, has met with all staff members, of, well, has met with all school staff. Um, we were actually able to do the Darcy staff after the fact uh, remotely um, just last week, so it was good that we were able to uh, get to see the Darcy team, um, even though it was planned for after uh, we all um, were out of our school. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Rich, who was um, did a wonderful job um, chairing this subcommittee. So thank you, Rich. And he also did all the work in putting uh, this presentation together. So we appreciate his time. And he's gonna take you through the highlights. Everyone should have received not only the presentation, but there was a more detailed write-up as well. But Rich is gonna take us to the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me start off, if I can, just by going through the charge. Uh, it was to meet with the staff and the teachers of each of the schools, gather their analysis of their facilities and how these are supporting or hindering their programs, and report back to the full committee. We've attempted to represent their comments fairly, uh, but we strongly urge each member of the committee and the public to read over the minutes, view the videos for the full extent of the comments. Our report is by its very nature, a summary of the major points. And this PowerPoint is an even broader summary. So uh, we would love for you to go back and take a look at those. Each individual teacher that spoke is, is uh, mentioned there. A few thank yous before I start off. Uh, Anne Marie Kemp and John Bates who uh, worked on the committee um, and sat through numerous meetings and many hours. Uh, Marlene Solano, I wanna thank for uh, organizing uh, each of the school meetings for us. Um, I want to note uh, Rob Morris and Sylvia Nichols, who uh, sat in on a number of the meetings, and I think lent a great deal of credibility uh, to our meetings when town council members are there uh, expressing their support for this process. And then uh, Marilyn Milton, um, who did numerous min uh, minutes, uh, was 
pushing them out three and four in a week at times, and Mike Salamini, who uh, videotaped uh, all the meetings. And then lastly, I just want to thank all the principals um, who uh, do a lot of organization for us. So, you know, if you have questions as I finish each slide, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I'm sure there'll be some time at, at the end to, to discuss. Um, okay, just a few things. So I got to move something on my screen here so I can actually read this. Right. There we go. Uh, first of all, you know, when we started this process, we were a little bit uncertain as to how uh, many teachers uh, would show up and we were very, very pleased. Uh, large numbers of teachers at each of the schools. Uh, in some cases, like the high school where we did two sessions, we had some people who came to both the morning and the afternoon because they wanted to make sure that they got all of their points in and uh, would, would uh, speak to what was going on. Uh, universally, the teachers at each of the schools expressed a great deal of pride uh, in the programs that, they, that they're uh, running right now. Um, despite, in some cases, the facilities that they're working in. There were some uh, commonalities that came up throughout. Um, many of these buildings are very, very old. They were built at a time when education, uh, where classrooms were run in a different way. Uh, and so consistently, uh, teachers talked about things like the fact that the rooms were very, very small for modern day programs very little or no storage available, uh, furniture that didn't allow for any kind of uh, flexible grouping. Oops. Um, there were concerns mentioned at every one of the schools about maintenance and environmental issues. Um, I do wanna point out though, that in almost every single case, they complimented the maintenance staff who they felt were really, really working very, very hard and trying their best uh, to keep the buildings looking, you know, as best they could and, and maintain issues. But they recognized that the schools were so old that it was very hard to keep up with it. Um, but as we went through the various uh, buildings, constantly we heard from teachers about how rooms were brutally hot or much too cold, how windows were leaking, uh, windows that didn't open, uh, particularly with some of the, um, the new uh, uh, procedures uh, for um, you know, lockdowns and things like that. Uh, in some buildings where there were roof leaks, uh, humidity issues, um, and throughout most of the schools, a uh, lack of airflow, uh, and only in all but a couple of the buildings, uh, no air conditioning. Um, Handicap accessibility uh, was an issue um, and specifically uh, an issue at uh, Chapman School and Humiston School, and we'll get into that in a little bit, uh, and to a lesser extent, uh, I and Darcy. Um, I do wanna point out um, the American Disabilities Act, I'm speaking here for myself, was passed in 1990. Uh, and as a principal, myself, and as a parent, I've witnessed firsthand uh, the horrible impact it has on our most vulnerable children when they're in a school facility that is not fully accessible. It is in my mind a real problem that the town of Cheshire has schools in 2020 that do not meet this standard and I have concern over how that impacts some of our children. Um, in most of the buildings or many of the buildings, there were concerns regarding security issues. Uh, we know that the town has been working to uh, put man traps on some of the schools, although that process has yet to be done in terms of real construction. Uh, and there were a number of other issues that came up in terms of uh, parents entering the building and not being able to be closely monitored. Uh, um, we did raise the question on grade configuration as we talked to different groups, um, as we talked to the elementary and middle school people, uh, here unanimous agreement that grade six should, if possible, uh, be in the middle school. A uh, couple of uh, teachers who also happened to be parents who liked the fact that their children stayed in the elementary school uh, an extra year, but the vast majority for program reasons really felt that the sixth grade belonged with the seventh and eighth grade. 
Uh, at Doolittle School, they are the only school right now that does not have the kindergarten students within their facility. And the teachers at Doolittle uh, strongly uh, urge that whatever plan we came out with, uh, that Doolittle kindergarten students uh, end up back in the school. I will say when we talked to the Darcy people, they understood programmatically why that would be good, but they also loved uh, the Darcy facility and school and, and, and liked being there. So uh, they weren't quite as strong as the Doolittle people were. Uh, so we're gonna go through each of the schools at this point. Um, first of all, Cheshire High, uh, as I said, we had two different meetings there. Uh, the AM meeting was with most of the administrators, department heads, uh, and then the PM meeting was open to anyone. Uh, both of them were just about standing room only meetings um, and went uh, an hour and a half, two hours each with lots and lots of comments. Um, the kinds of things that were laid out and then much more in the minutes and things, but an old building uh, with numerous environmental issues throughout the school. Uh, the layout of the building inhibits uh, many of the programs and we heard lots and lots of stories about how the drama program is really inhibited by the fact that uh, the, the facilities aren't laid out properly, the music program, uh, that there isn't uh, enough space, enough storage. Um, and because of the way the school over many, many years has been added on, um, it's just a poor layout uh, that, that uh, sometimes really gets in the way of uh, program. Uh, many of the classrooms are too small for modern programs. Uh, they were designed at a time where teachers stood in front and did a lecture to 25 students. Uh, the science labs, um, some of them are badly in need of updating um, and not designed with instructional areas. The teachers really talked about uh, the, the classrooms needed to have both a lab area and an instructional area, and they weren't designed that way. Uh, the building cannot control access to select areas when in use by the public. Um, um, you're going to hear from Sylvia and the uh, visitation committee uh, in an upcoming meeting, but when we went to a place like uh, Guilford High School, uh, it was designed with a separate entrance that you could use if you were just using the auditorium or the gymnasium, closed off the rest of the building. Uh, so you had security and you didn't have people having access throughout the building. Um, the way that uh, Cheshire High has been added on to, you don't have that flexibility. And some really, some serious safety concerns regarding buses and parent student drivers and the amount of traffic uh, that tends to go through that facility. Uh, Humiston was a very, very interesting meeting, um, and Jen Bates may want to jump in on it because um, she in particular really uh, found it very interesting. Um, this is a small program, an alternative high school program with I think about 25 students that's housed in the back building at Humiston. Um, teachers extremely uh, positive about the impact that their program has and what they're doing with students. Um, however, at the same time, just an extremely inadequate facility. Um, the uh, the uh, office is in the basement. There's no direct line of entrance. You can't see what's there other than through a camera, uh, but, you know, that uh, is there. There's no nurse's room at all. You've got high school age uh, children there, uh, high school age uh, girls who uh, do not have uh, access to a, a nurse's room. Uh, there's no science lab in the school at all. They borrow some science equipment from the high school. There's a gymnasium on the third floor, uh, but due to a low ceiling and due to the fact that it's over top of classrooms, you're not allowed to run it and you're not allowed to play ball in it. So um, it's not your typical gym. Um, there are, there's a boys bathroom and a girls bathroom in the basement, which is used by both the students and the teachers together. Uh, the girls have gotten together and painted and decorated it. Uh, they said the boys were, you know, thinking of the same thing. Uh, but those are the bathrooms that cover most of the building. There are bathrooms between the classrooms on the second floor. Um, 
And these were clearly designed for elementary age kids. Um, the, the, uh, the, the toilets and things are not appropriate for high school level. The doors on them uh, don't lock. And you've got high school age kids using these things. Uh, there are no staff bathrooms and no bathrooms dedicated for staff at all. Uh, the building is not handicap accessible at all. Um, and they talked about the library. And as we walked around and we finally said, well, where is the library? And the library turned out to be a closet that was maybe five foot by five foot. Uh, and the students had created a library within this little closet. So we walked out of there very, very proud of the program and the things they were doing and impressed by the staff that saying one thing the school modernization committee really has to, you know, deal with uh, is improving this facility. Um, and we pointed out because a small program like Palmerston could easily be overlooked in our, in our uh, discussions. Uh, Dodd Middle School obviously was a major conversation. We spent a long time with a large group of teachers there. I couldn't uh, begin to go through all of the issues and concerns that they raised. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, they did strongly support uh, having the sixth grade within the school. Um, they pointed out that modern day middle schools are often designed for the teens that exist. You know, you would have four or five uh, classrooms within a pod where the art, or not art, English, science, social studies, math, sometimes foreign language would all be housed within that one area. Dodd wasn't designed that way. It was designed as a traditional junior high school. Um, and so the facility itself uh, does not encourage some of the interdisciplinary teaming that you would want to see in a middle school. Uh, classrooms are small uh, for modern programs. A um, number of space issues were, were discussed. Some of them are things like there's a very small stage and there's no auditorium in the building. Uh, that's meant that a number of students who wanted to get involved with drama programs had to be dropped because there just was no way of accommodating them. Uh, the small cafeteria is too in a, is inadequate. Uh, so you're running a number of lunch waves to try to get students in and out. Um, and even the location of it causes some issues in terms of student movement. Um, a band room that's too small to accommodate the entire band. Um, they discussed at length the, the fields um, and described them as the worst of any of the schools that play uh, against Dodd. Uh, so the other middle schools uh, were described as having much better fields than we do. Um, parking, as we know, in that facility is extremely limited and the bus and student drop-off areas um, are a safety problem and that the students have to cross, uh, go across where the buses are in order to get in. <clears throat> uh, Chapman Elementary School, uh, the committee visited, uh, well, we visited all of them, or just about all of them. Uh, again, uh, the teachers were extremely positive about the school and about the program. Uh, they love the intimate environment of the school, the, uh, but the facility itself uh, is, an ex is uh, very inadequate. Uh, there's no handicap accessibility. Uh, so when you come into the building, there is a floor above you of classrooms and there's a floor below you. And uh, you can't get upstairs um, at all if you're handicapped. And to go downstairs, you have to go outside. Uh, the library is down in the basement area. It has no windows. It's a, a pretty depressing kind of area. Um, and it's, it's surrounded by a band room and a cafeteria, which uh, causes some real noise issues. Um, lots of issues regarding classroom temperatures, lack of electricity in the rooms, lack of hot water in the sinks. Uh, it's an old building and that clearly came through loud and clear. And again, the student drop off and bus areas are a safety concern. Um, Norton School, a um, lot of discussion about the portable classrooms that are behind Norton. Um, evidently, these have been there for quite some time. Um, they house the art room and physical therapy. Um, there's a lot of issues uh, regarding uh, uh, the heat that are in the, those rooms. In fact, they've had to be 
The classes have had to be moved out at times because the rooms became unbearable. Uh, accessibility uh, and some real security concerns because of the portables. Um, the teachers uh, spoke of a lack of adequate storage and uh, a need for more electrical access in the rooms. Uh, there was some discussion about the, if you know that building, there's no lobby area at all. Uh, you walk into a corridor um, uh, and no way to uh, put the students together for bus dismissal or anything like that. Um, and because of the way that you enter that building, there were some concerns expressed regarding security that the parents can walk in and bypass the office and move on. Uh, library is off in a side area. It's not located in a central area. Um, and there was a stated need for some kind of a multi-purpose space. Uh, Doolittle Elementary School, uh, most of the concerns that we heard were maintenance related. Um, you know, windows, electrical, things like that. Um, and a discussion about the kindergarten class. Uh, overall, the Doolittle teachers feel the facility is uh, in pretty good shape but obviously needs some updating in terms of some of the, the maintenance issues that they had. And we had about a good hour and a quarter, and there was a lot of discussions about those maintenance issues, but that was what the focus was. Highland School is definitely in the best shape of all the schools in the district. It's held up very well for a school that was built back in the 70s. Uh, the uh, issues and concerns by the staff, again, were just some maintenance issues, uh, window replacements, airflow problems, things like that. Uh, there was some discussion about um, some uh, changes uh, for better uh, handicap accessibility. Um, and then as you know, it was built in many areas uh, for, with open spaces and some of those aren't closed up and teachers talked about noise issues. Uh, as Anne Marie just uh, mentioned, we did get together with Darcy. We were afraid that that was going to be the one school we weren't going to be able to, to speak with. And we were able to do a, a Zoom meeting last week uh, with the Darcy staff and uh, got a good turnout uh, on our Zoom meeting. Uh, as you know, the building is very, very old. Uh, it is not fully handicap accessible. There is an elevator, uh, but there's some areas that are difficult to get to. Uh, bathroom spaces for the students and the staff are not always appropriate. They're sharing spaces. They're not handicap accessible. The uh, bathrooms uh, don't always have the proper sizes for the preschool age kids that they're working with. Um, the pre-K classrooms, uh, they noted, were of a good size. The kindergarten classrooms, they said, were fairly small and not sufficient. Uh, the uh, special teachers, such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech teacher, the remedial reading and math people, um, are either sharing spaces or have no space. Uh, they're conducting some of the programs within the classrooms or in the hallway, uh, in an area in front of the elevator. Um, so there's a real space issue there. Uh, and they mentioned a, a number of security concerns. Um, uh, one of the main ones is the front door is not handicap accessible, so a lot of people come in through the back, um, which does have, uh, you know, an opening by the office, um, but once parents are in the building, then it's very difficult to make sure that they come to the office, check in, things like that. Um, overall, as I said, I think the, the, the teachers are very proud of the programs they're running. Um, they feel that they've got you know, good support from their maintenance people. Um, they recognize that there are a lot of issues um, and we're very, very pleased that the committee wanted to hear from them. Uh, and they took the advantage of uh, giving us a great deal of detail of which this is only a very broad outline. So, that's, that's it on our end, and uh, I'm sure that Anne Marie and Jen and I would be more than glad to answer any questions you've got. Rich, nice job. Thank you. Jen, is there anything you wanted to add? Oh, I'm sorry, Sylvia, you had a question. Just make sure you unmute. Not a, not a question, just um, I, I 
the process was very well done and I have heard outside of this committee many comments from the teaching staff that they were pleased to be included. So I think all the information we gather is going to be of great assistance when our, uh, our, our consultant gets up and running and it will be important to have those discussions with them because that's the people who need to hear this. Um, so I think it's great that we're transparent, great that we're asking for help from the community. For that part, I think you did a great job. Thanks. Right. Ken, is there anything you want to chime in on? I think Rich covered it pretty well. Um, okay. Well, a lot of the things that we just talked about were uh, safety issues, which were very concerning. Um, but some of the things also they were complaining about were things like the HVAC and stuff like that, where um, obviously we wouldn't, you know, design a school that had bad HVAC. Um, so it was a challenge sometimes to get them to um, focus on the fact that we're looking for what they need to be successful, rather than just a place to list all of the issues that they had with the current school, but we definitely did take all that into consideration um, and tried to steer it back a little bit a few times. Um, but we did get so much valuable information, so it was very worthwhile. Agree. Anne, did you have a comment or a question? Anne? Yeah. Thank you. Um, very good presentation. Thank you, team. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, that when we were visiting Guilford High School, and um, because Rich, you made um, such a big issue of the alternative high school program that with the way that high school was designed, they were able to use parts of it and just sort of split the hours so that the alternative high school kids were in an area of the high school from say, I don't remember exactly times, 11 to four in, 11 a.m. till four in the afternoon when the other kids were not in that area in the regular high school. So um, it's using the same space, but uh, shifting hours somehow. And um, and I, I don't know if that's gonna belong in, in the other presentation, but um, it was a pretty, inventive solution to mm -hmm. the problem of having the alternative high school and having it um, situated somewhere else. Right, that's interesting. I know, um, I actually missed the Humiston meeting, but I do recall in reading the, the notes that some of the staff felt very strongly about not having it located um, in the same place as the high school. So um, again, weighing what's what's right and what's not, but that was what was expressed by the Humiston staff, I believe. Yeah, Marie, could I uh, just interject there Absolutely. for a second? Absolutely, yep. Um, that was actually asked. We did specifically ask them if they would like to have a specific section, even a different building on the same campus of this hypothetical new high school that may or may not ever happen. Um, but if that was a possibility, would they want a separate building on the same campus? And they were very adamant that part of the experience of this alternative high school is to make sure the kids feel safe. And a lot of them do not feel safe in such a big environment like the high school. Um, so they were very, very strongly adamant about that. Okay. Um, I had Don's hand up before, and then I know I have Renee and Tony too. Don? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that was a very good presentation, Richard. I appreciate it. Um, just a couple of comments on on a thing. Uh, when you said that the biggest problem at some of these schools was maintenance issues, and, and I have to agree, uh, having traveled through some of the schools and, and seeing um, simple maintenance issues that could have been rectified to keep from the problems from getting worse. And I think, you know, anytime we're going to be putting money into a new school building or renovating, we have to make sure that the maintenance is as good as the building itself, because if we don't do the maintenance, then there's no point in spending all the money and, and doing it. And I think that was a big pro part of the problem that we've had in some of the schools. Um, the other thing I have to agree with Richard on is uh, the ADA accessibility. Um, it's not just for the students because I have a wife who uh, has a disability. And when we had parent teacher conferences at Chapman, my wife could not go because she couldn't go up the steps. And I think it's an important thing to remember that it's not just for the students, but it's for teachers, for parents and everybody else. So mm -hmm. it is important to make sure that uh, we get in line with the ADA uh, compliance so that 
you know, we don't discriminate against parents or teachers or students who, who can't move around in the school safely. But that's all I had to say. Thanks. Okay, thanks. And just one note on uh, on the maintenance, because I don't want I don't want there to be an impression. And everyone did speak so highly of their maintenance staff, and I think I think the challenge in a lot of cases. Um, you know, it does come down to budget, right? I mean, so, you know, we were at Highland and you all heard, um, you know, they're replacing the windows, but they replaced, you know, two windows in two classrooms a year. So by the time you get through the whole building, the, where you started is almost ready for, um, to start all over again. So it's like, it, it's just a matter of how to keep up with it. Um, and a lot of that is budget driven. So that's- a, Well, you know, know. But there was one school that was specifically where they said, there, there was caulk that had come out of a window for mm -hmm. over a year and the water was coming in. Now, I mean, right. a caulk gun doesn't cost much just to go in and caulk the window, keep the water from going in at least. So simple things like that, I'm, I, that's what I'm talking about. But I understand, you know, like we all have homes, you know, um, there's always something you have to do. Yep, no, absolutely. Um, Tony was in the queue and Chuck, I think was, and Matt, I see you as well. Uh, I think Renee was ahead of me. He was. Renee. Where'd you so go, Renee? Renee? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll bow to you, Renee, and I'll wait. <laughs> <you. Right. laughs> oh, thank you, Tony. Uh, kudos to the team for the nice presentation and work on this. Um, my question was uh, related to uh, uh, different points in the process here. We have talked about closing some buildings. Was that topic ever brought up with the school staff? No. Well, there was some at Chapman just because Chapman has been obviously discussed and rumored to be closed um, for 10 plus years now. Um, so I think that was the only building where it directly came up. We did not ask um, staff to, to weigh in on that. Um, you know, our, we didn't feel that was the, the, the mission of, of why we were there. Tony? Thanks, yeah, great presentation and you know, a lot of what was summarized is not really much different than what we heard about three years ago, which is good. You know, it's, it's good to see that the staff, I mean, they're, they're our backbone of our school system, as everyone knows. Uh, at the end of the day, what happens in their classroom, how effective the education is delivered, you know, they're the people we tend to listen to and get ideas from. So I'm, I'm happy that they're engaged and being very forthcoming with their feedback. Again. Even three years ago, I, I've never even sensed any animosity or, or uh, negativity. They're just trying to help us make the right decisions. So thank you for doing the work. I know a lot of time is spent on that. Uh, you know, regards with the Humpson High School, it is not a model in Cheshire where, I, and again, I'll refer to Marlene and Jeff later, but uh, if you guys talk to Tracy Huss and your team, you know that the program there um, is not something that they would like to pick up, plug into a larger school because some of the kids that go to Humiston do not um, foster or do well in a larger setting to various concerns, social emotional learning. So I'm not surprised Tracy's against that. I do like the idea that Ann brought up about possibly um, staggering time somehow. And I hope uh, if Colliers comes on and we use them, maybe it's something to help us look into to see if it's not for the high school, other grade levels, other I mean, that's something we could look at as part of the solution for the overall plan. So, but nonetheless, thank you for that feedback. And, um, you know, I'm glad uh, maintenance came up because even with a new school, I mean, you expect that there be zero maintenance. There's going to be something. I don't think the extent we have today with the other schools, one is it's got to be adequately funded. So, yeah, our budgets are reduced. There is budget reduced every year. There's no, no excuse to that. Just what it is. We can't see what we can have. Maintenance is one of those line items. I don't know if it's buying a $5 clock gun. If it is, I'll buy one tomorrow and bring it to Vincent. My guess is a little more to it than that. But the point is, as we move forward, let's, let's bake into our costs that it's not just building these new schools. And it'll, it'll be good to see from Collier's, uh, if they help us with some analysis, what they typically see for new school construction or renovations as far as maintenance costs that, you know, we could probably might want to expect. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, Chuck, did you have something? I was just going to uh, comment real quick. I thought the presentation was good. I thought the challenge was, you know, pretty well in front of you there. Um, Jen kind of touched on it. 
you know, it seemed like we got a laundry list of a lot of stuff that we already knew wasn't wrong with the schools or needed to be fixed. Did we get any sense of like what the priority was for some of these? Because as we talked about in the past, this is going to be a 10 year program or something to that magnitude where we're not going to be able to fix everything right away. So did we get any sort of sense of like a priority at these different places and you know, what they couldn't live with the way it currently is? Well, I mean, I'll let Rich and Jen give their perspective. I think for, from my perspective, I felt like the feedback we got from staff at the high school and the middle school um, was more along the lines of what currently exists is actually hindering some of the teaching process, right? So, you know, we heard teachers say, we go for continuing education, get really excited about something and then return to our school and realize we can't implement it here because my class is too small or it's too this, or, you know, like they physically can't do their job or if they're doing their job, they physically can't do more of what they'd like to do and what they're looking into in continuing education in those facilities. Whereas I felt like at the elementary schools, um, you know, I think Highland and, and Doolittle and even Norton, like they find their classrooms are, are adequate, you know, to the spaces appropriate for what they need to do. There are things that need to be improved in all of the schools, but I felt like there wasn't a, um, a phys as much of a physical hindrance from the facility standpoint to teaching as it is at the high school and the middle school. That was my perspective. Uh, I'll ditto that. I think that's, that's exactly what came up. Uh, there clearly are program issues from the high school and middle school level. Um, the elementary, I think the program uh, is being run. It's just, you know, they need uh, rooms that don't have temperature changes, windows that don't leak, that sort of thing, more storage, you know, a lot of those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> but clearly at the high school and middle school level, there were program issues. Uh, I don't know that those are things that could easily be fixed unless you did a major school-wide renovation or built brand new facilities. Uh, the kinds of things they were talking about um, in terms of uh, class sizes, labs, uh, uh, you know, uh, team areas at the middle school, all those kinds of things um, require a different kind of design than what we have presently. Um. One thing I'd like to add is that uh, I agree with both Anne-Marie and Richard. However, I do think there is a program issue in the elementary schools as well, and that is the sixth graders, and that they are not getting the right education. Um, they don't have science labs. They don't have core teachers that are specializing in the subjects that they need to learn. Um, they're more in an elementary environment. So moving the sixth graders into an environment where they can actually be with a specialized teacher, um, rotate through all the teachers and have the lab equipment that they need for science would be very beneficial. So I do think that was a big priority and making sure that those sixth graders can get a better education. I agree. Uh, Matt. Thank you. Um, it seems that all in all of the schools, uh, the number one priority was maintenance issues. And if these are a constant issue, why aren't they being addressed sooner than later? And why are we going to bond tens or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars for maintenance issues? I, I would certainly have a problem with that. Uh, our schools are closed right now. I have no idea. It seems that every school there's a problem with the uh, HVAC systems. Why aren't they being balanced and why isn't that being addressed at this time now and get that off the plate of this committee. I don't think maintenance issues are should be a, a, a part of, of the committee. Is Kyle, you're with us tonight? No. I don't are they part of this meeting? Well, they no. attended all our meetings. I didn't know if they were, uh, were watching this or is there any way for us to tell if they are? If they're watching it, they'd have to be watching on YouTube. So there's no way for us okay. to tell that. I, I was just curious. Um, we're going to be bringing them on soon. Yep, it's next on the agenda. We're um, going to talk about them. We, we had uh, mentioned in a couple of schools were, were environmental issues. Are these something uh, rich that needs to be addressed sooner than later? Uh, what are you considering an environmental issue? Is this something that is detrimental to our students? 
for our staff? Um, let me take a look. Where was that mentioned? I believe that largely came up when it came to air quality, if I recall correctly. Yeah, it may have been. I mean, there was, oh, and then the high school had a number of questions about uh, the areas that were below in the, uh, uh, the tunnels and things like that. And um, that people came back after the fact and said that the, some of the teachers didn't have the most updated information, um, but they were talking about uh, some uh, environmental issues in those tunnels. You know those tunnels well, Matt, and they, we were told that you know, they've, they've been cleaned at this point and that there isn't any real issue. They have, and I have been in those tunnels to help clean them and to help maintain them. Uh, there was a ventilation system installed not too long ago um, really one of the major problems of uh, the air being brought up out of the tunnels was the negative air pressure in the classroom because the, again the HVAC system was not balanced uh, but there is a system in there uh, and uh, Vin could certainly uh, speak to this better than I can uh, there's testing being done there continually and I don't believe there is any air quality issues at Cheshire High School right now? Vince? I'll speak to a couple of things. The, um, you know, the tunnels underneath the old portion of the building, you know, they've, they've been a recurring problem over decades, but the um, negative air pressure, there's a system installed. So basically any air in the tunnel is, is exited out through the roof that, that's been maintained. It's still running. We haven't had any significant complaints from teachers um, about having allergic conditions, right? What typically would happen in the past, mold would grow in the tunnels and then it would leach up into the classroom. So we've been in really good shape. We have those tunnels inspected every summer um, to make sure that we have <clears throat> no water that's permeated into the tunnels. We've replaced all of the old insulation on the piping, uh, which, you know, was conducive to mold growth. That's all been replaced with mold resistant um, pipe wrap. And we actually added some additional pipe wrap over this summer to try and keep the temperatures in the main office areas down, which was a, a recurring problem as well. So, you know, and the other thing I want to address just while I have the floor for a minute, you know, when it comes to, you know, routine and daily maintenance, if there's an issue in the building, you know, our staff is all over it. And, you know, I, I know that there was a, one of the items that came out was there was a window that was leaking for a year, you know, that wasn't caulked. I mean, I don't know what the specific nature of that was, but if, if there's an item reported, it's addressed quickly. It goes onto a, an online system. You know, it's, it's looked at by the maintenance staff, the maintenance supervisor, the maintenance manager. And if it's something that's gonna be simply fixed with caulk, that's, that's gonna get done. Now, what happens if something doesn't get reported and it doesn't get noticed, you know, a year later you have a complaint, the window's been leaking. You know, I, obviously we're not ignoring the buildings, we're doing the best we can, you know, budget's an issue, but we take care of the routine things, you know, as quickly and as, and, you know, as effectively as we can. And then Matt, to address your point, yeah, the buildings have been closed. So what, what our maintenance staff has been doing is not only closing work orders, but they've actually been going through and doing some of the summer cleaning that we would ordinarily outsource to a vendor. And that's, like, that's gonna save us quite a bit of money over the, you know, not only with, over the last two months, but going into the summer. And some HVAC work that is being done, you know, we mentioned, you know, Norton had some problems, you know, with the portables. We went out to bid um, for Norton's unit ventilators and we're gonna start replacing those. We did get bids back, that bid was awarded this week. So we are addressing, you know, those, those larger HVAC issues, but those are not really maintenance issues. Those are, you know, replacements. So, so I understand we, that, Vin, 
but it still is, it's got to be something that has to be scheduled. Uh, if you go back to the uh, 2017 report, everything was classified in uh, one, two, three, four, and five. And it, we're now four years down the road or three years down the road. And some of those things in, 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 uh, in one were supposed to be addressed in 12 to 18 months. And, you know, that's why I asked if Collier was on, because I think Collier can take the information that has been learned uh, from uh, the committee and put together a plan or put together a presentation for us so that we will understand uh, and prioritize uh, what has to be done in these schools. Um, just to add also, um, you know, Darcy and Humiston, um, those are our two oldest schools. Uh, Humiston needs to be closed. Uh, Darcy needs to be closed, but we need to have uh, some numbers to put together as to what it's going to save us annually in certainly in maintenance insurance so if we close the school it can't be uh well it's approximately it has to be something that that's a, a fairly accurate number so that we can make an informed decision as to what are we going to save by closing darcy what are we going to save by closing chapman what are we going to save by closing humiston and what are we going to do with the programs? Uh, Homiston, there's, I believe, 30, approximately 30 students in the alternate high school. I, I'm sure that we can find some place in the system for, for 30 students. Um, but this, this whole program that we're putting together is, if we don't build some sort of school, there's no way that we're going to be able to without an expansion of Doolittle to put the kindergarten in there. And I do think that is important. I think that it's important that the, uh, that the students have their siblings from kindergarten through fifth grade. And I do think that a, a middle concept of six, seven, and eight is very important. But again, you're not going to do that without some sort of, of new building. Um, I guess that's, uh, that's all I have to say about that. Okay, um, Tony. Oh. Actually, Sylvia had her hand. Sylvia, I saw her hand after yours. Unmute. It takes me a minute. <laughs> Matt, I, I appreciate all those comments, but I don't know that this is the time that we need to make take a lot of time to think about them other than to import all this information we're gathering. And as I listen to this, the teachers' reports, and I couple that with our, and you will get that in our school report, but we wanted you to see this first and the next project will to have, will be to share our tours. Many of the, the schools that we visited, we were able to speak with some of the teachers and even after all of their modernizations and their new schools and new ones or refurbished ones, they said things like, we don't have enough storage, we don't have this, we wish we had that, we should have different bathroom doors. So there's a lot of work to be done to put all of this information that we're getting into a cohesive package. And that's what we're expecting Colliers to do for us or our rep, if that's where we go. And, and so for our discussions this evening, it's basically to, to be able to listen to all this information, store it away, have it ready, so that when they begin to develop these plans, as you're talking about, Matthew, Matt, um, things like, What's the plan? Do we close this? Do we open that? How do we do that? That's what we're expecting them to help us with. So I think tonight, for me anyway, I think it's great to see the tourists and listen to the teachers. I think you will find interesting the next week when you see the schools we were able to visit. Unfortunately, our tours were cut short since everybody's closed, but we have sufficient information and we can continue to go and visit. There's no reason not to continue to do that. Um, at speaking from the council perspective, I think we, I'm very concerned that we continue to go forward with this. Obviously we need this project to be done, but we also have to recognize the culture and the financial place we are in right now. And so when we finish this discussion, I'd like to have an opportunity a little bit later in the meeting to 
just voice some concerns that I have. I sent you some thoughts in the mail, uh, an email some time ago. Um, if we, if any of this is going to work, we have to have a buy-in from the from the teachers and the educational people and the residents of Cheshire. And I'm concerned that we are expecting to get this all done in very rapid time frame, which scares me. So after we're finished with this, I'd like an opportunity to lay out a couple of things that are on my mind. But in the meantime, this program, this presentation, Rich, was great. Um, Rich is also working because he knows how to do PowerPoint and I don't to put our, our visit things into a nice neat PowerPoint as well. Save all this information and when we get our rep on board, these are the conversations that we will have with them as we progress forward. That's my, my position at the moment. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, was there someone else in the queue? Now I forget. It was me. Tony, anyway, that's really, who it was. Really yeah. Quick. Listen to Matt earlier. One of the things that the board of it can do is, you know, and we'll work with Vincent on this. Is do we have any more uh, teacher input sessions coming up, or is that pretty much? It? So no, we, we did. So now we have a pretty good, pretty good summary of what we've heard. It sounds like there might be some opportunities to do some quick low-hanging fruit maintenance um, tasks that might give us some wins. So I think, you know, you know, Matt keeps asking about uh, balancing the HVAC systems, things like that. So we can take it up in the planning community and board of ed, see if there's anything in there that we've learned so far that while this is going on, we could potentially address as part of our routine, you know, day-to-day -day maintenance so forth. There's gotta be something there. I mean, there's always something new we're learning. So we'll definitely uh, yep. look into that. Um, but beyond that, I thought this was a good, good presentation. A lot of time went into it. And uh, if teachers are watching, you know, thank you for taking the time to, to do this for us. It's very helpful. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Yeah, the teachers, um, again, just to reiterate what Rich said, were, um, were terrific. Um, they certainly are hardworking and they, they do the best they can in the, in the environments and circumstances that they have. And they're, they're definitely good advocates for our children and education in this town. So um, we were pleasantly surprised by the turnout and um, appreciate them taking the time. So um, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Jen. Appreciate it. There were a lot of meetings in there. Um, so thank you for getting out to all of them. And Rich, thanks for that presentation. Um, if there aren't any other comments on the presentation, then we'll move on um, to get an update from Vin and Chuck on Collier's. And everyone should have received um, the contract and the updated pricing that Collier's had provided. It was sent out um, by Arnett earlier. So I will turn you know, back to Chuck and Vin to take us through that and talk through what's what's been done so far since our last meeting. Chuck. Sure, Vin could probably expand on it a little bit more than I, but uh, we met with uh, Chuck Warrington on Monday just to talk about their um, their hourly proposal on not to exceed budget. And I think that's what we had gotten uh, Arnett had sent out, you know, that kind of included the negotiated fees that we had in there. Um, and we just, you know, kind of answered some questions that we, we all had, like how they came up with the, um, the fees to begin with. You know, they laid it, he laid it out for us based on the amount of time um, dedicated to each phase. And, you know, the people that they had there, you have their hourly rates and you can kind of piece it together as Renee kind of did uh, unofficially there as well. So, I mean, it all seemed to make sense. The, uh, the scope, seem good um they're ready to go as far as uh they're itching to get started i'm not sure where the the contract part of it stands with the, the town i think vin and arnett were kind of handling that the rest of this week so we'll let him talk to that okay thanks chuck i'll just add a, a few pieces of information the what we did share with the committee is the letter from colliers that followed the conversation that Chuck Neth and I had with Chuck Warrington from Collier's. There's too many Chucks in, in one small <laughs> group. So that's why I have to specify which one's which. So what they um, documented in the letter is a couple of things for us. First of all, the fees would, um, the fees did come down from their original proposal and their first proposal for ref pre-referendum phase one and two, they had quoted 47,000. They brought that down to 41,000 and they presented that um, the night of the, the interviews. Pro proposal phase two, which is uh, pre-referendum phase three, 
they brought that down from 59,300 to 30,000. And that's, you know, partially because they, they looked at the scope and, you know, I think they got a better understanding of what we were looking for. And then the last portion of the proposal, uh, which was for post-referendum phase one, that remained at 14.4. So assuming that Kalia's work from their original proposal, which was 120,700, this letter that they provided uh, brings that down to 85,400. The things that I think are key that were documented in the letter that uh, Chuck and I spoke to Chuck about is that, you know, number one, they did provide this as a not to exceed quote now. So, you know, they'll complete the work as specified, but they will not exceed um, the number that they have quoted here, which I think is, is helpful for us. The other piece that's in this letter is that they will not, we're not giving them an award for $85,400. We're giving them a phase by phase and the committee has to approve moving on to the successive phases. So that basically it's pay as we go. Um, they invoice monthly, you know, very detailed invoices. They show us, they showed us a sample of the uh, invoice when we were on the phone. Um, I actually was on a video conference. So, you know, I, I think at this point we have um, in this letter, which has been incorporated into the proposed agreement, I think we have a reasonable proposal. I, I think the costs um, are in line with with what we're looking for. I, I think they've done you know, a nice job of offering to bring the cost down for us. They seem very, very anxious to get started. So the switching over to the contract, we did provide to the committee members a copy of the contract. Uh, this was reviewed by Mike Donnelly, who uh, works for the town attorney's office, Mirtha Kalina. So I think the contract, you know, assuming the, the committee is comfortable with the numbers, um, the contract is ready to be executed. It, it would have to be executed by the town manager, Sean Kimball. So that's, uh, I think, the highlights. Great. And I'll certainly answer any questions if there are any. Okay, great, thank you. That is, uh, I was happy to see the price um, where we landed. I think that's a much better number. So that's, that's good, we appreciate that. Anybody have comments, questions? Tony, you had one earlier, Tony. A question, uh, Vin or Chuck, I, I, I'm not sure how many in the committee uh, talked to Collier's since the presentation. But when he presented to us uh, a couple weeks ago, they didn't have an issue with meeting original timelines. Have you, have they changed their tune or are they concerned about to trying to achieve and that plays a role into the contract negotiation? Um, yeah, we did talk about timeline. We certainly know that the timeline is aggressive, but um, if we're ready to meet, you know, a November timeframe, you know, I, I think they are, or well, that's what they're representing. But I think the reality, um, and this has nothing to do with Collier's, but, you know, to get to a November referendum, what we would have to have is a building project. You know, we would have to identify how big, what grades it is, um, some estimated cost, some specs, educational specs. So I, I don't, on my opinion, I don't think it's realistic to get there with a building project by November. I guess what I should ask um, was if I'm Collier's and looking at the timeline and, and again, I'm not, first of all, I'm not trying to come across as full of quit that we're not gonna meet the timeline. That's not my intent. I'm coming across as we're bringing Collier's on board, whoever it would have been, it's June. Let's face it, it's the end of May already. They got to be thinking, okay, in order for us to, to help this committee achieve all these things, we got to uh, get going, you know, by a certain point of no return. In other words, uh, you know, I was wondering if there's any feedback from them yet. And of course, if we, if we bring them on board, it sounds like they will, we'll ask them these questions. But in their minds, they got to be thinking, okay, if we don't get the, on the ground running by June 15th, there's a possibility we can't meet that timeline. So. Um, I'm curious to hear what they have to say and, you know, if they've seen other school districts or other towns go through this in an aggressive manner and what lessons were learned. Okay. I'm just kind of curious, but they seem to be willing to do what it takes to get us there. So that's, that's always a good sign. 
Yeah, we did bring up the timeline when we talked to him on Monday. And, you know, he kind of laid it out in the Gantt chart of what their commitment level was to try and get us there. And I think that's part of the uh, the angst for them to get started. I think they kind of recognize that, you know, we're in crunch time here and they need to kind of get involved. And, you know, he'd even brought up, uh, talk about this later, I guess, but he brought up, you know, the need to uh, refresh some enrollment projections and the uh, study on the elementary schools to kind of get the ball rolling on any middle school discussion of what might happen to those other schools kind of, um, you know, they're already, yeah. looking, they're already looking to get started, let's say. So I think- I'm glad you bring that up because from my point of view, and I don't want to get into it now, but the enrollment study is a huge part of this because the last one we did, you know, it's almost I mean, you know, four years, really three years. And at the time we were just coming off, you know, really starting to get over the hurdle of the economic downturn back in 2010. I mean, long to get there. Here we are. COVID, uh, that's lingering. I know that's going to play a role in projections. So I think for us, that's critical to have. And that could be updated new information that might change some of the options. So, you know, definitely want to see that. So thanks for bringing that up, Chuck. Yep. Andrew, did you have a comment? Sure. On the, on the flip side, was it talked about what the cost implications would be um, for extending it out an extra year? With Colliers for the um, for their putting together the plans, and then secondly, if we approve this tonight, does it have to go to the town council for approval before they could actually get started, or could we vote and they could get hit the ground running now? My understanding was it didn't have to go to the town council. Arnett, can you answer that? It, it does not. The money has been appropriated, and the council has um, has authorized this group to to go ahead. So and we, it, should, it will be. It will be announced to count. It'll be shared with council, though. Obviously, they want the info. To your question about the timeline extending, you know, we had talked about that with them as well. And, you know, the way it's it's written in their proposal and that, that letter is they have a certain scope of services that they have a not to exceed fee. So whether that's, you know, over the course of two months and they're, they're cranking on it or it extends beyond that, the scope is the scope and the not to exceed is is the number. So provided the scope doesn't drastically change and we're not cramming more information into what we were looking for in pre-referendum phase one, I mean, that's that's the fee that they're going to work hourly up to. Good, yeah. Good, and that's another reason why I think I like the idea of going phase by phase with them and improving phase by phase because if our timeline changes, then that I think helps control um, controls that as well. So good. Anybody have comments, Matt? Yeah, I, I think our timeline is definitely going to change, especially with the, the COVID uh, situation that's going on. Uh, we don't even know uh, how the national election is going to work out uh, as, as far as uh, how we're going to be voting. Uh, but I think that we need to switch from trying to get this thing done quickly to still trying to get it done quickly. But we have, I think we have a little more time. And I think the word that, that's going to, to, to come around a little bit, uh, or I hope that it comes around is shovel ready. So I think that we need to, uh, you know, proceed as quickly as possible and get ourselves into a position where uh, if the economy continues to tank and there is federal and state money that is thrown into the economy more than they've thrown in already, that we are ready to go and and uh, and request that type of funding. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate that the bonding is is as low as it's ever been, and uh, we could be missing this opportunity. But uh, I, I think again that we've got to get this right. Uh, I've said that from the start, um, and I think now we just try to be shovel ready so that when we are ready to go, and we're ready to bring this to the uh, to the voters that uh, you know we can be successful. Anybody else have any other comments, questions? All right, so could we um, take a vote? We need to take a vote, I assume, to move forward at least with uh, phase one, proposal one. So I guess I'd ask um, if anyone is not in agreement with moving forward with Colliers um, to raise your hand, because that'll be easier. Anybody who's not in favor? I see no hands, so. 
That means it passes unanimously. Or do I need a motion? Sorry. I thought we had already voted to uh, to hire we, Collier. No, forward with the negotiation. I think we have to approve this budget. Correct. So I guess I'll take a motion. <laughs> so a second. Second. All right. Now, anybody who is against it, raise your hand. All right. Now I see no objection. So now I can say it passes unanimously. Thank you. Congratulations. Protocol, protocol on a Zoom meeting is hard for me. I don't know why. All right. Excellent. Thank you, um, Chuck and Vin, again. Um, so in terms of next steps, then, Vin, obviously, we need to wait for the contractor, you know, for that to move forward. But I guess I'm anxious to say how soon can we have a conversation with Colliers and, and to actually get moving? I, I mean, I, my opinion, as quickly as we want, they're as anxious as we are. Okay. That's actually, the contract's kind of shovel ready. So hopefully, okay. you know, we get their signature and um, Sean Kimball's signature in the next couple of days. So that part's easy. And I know Chuck wants to talk about the enrollment study as, as clearly yep. an important next step. Yep. Um, and it sounds like Collier has already been doing some research. I, I'd be surprised if they aren't listening, you know, to tonight's Same. video conference. But Same. Um, we'll see. Okay. Yeah, but, I mean, my understanding was the enrollment study was always intended to be part of that first phase anyway, right? For them to get go through all the existing data, which they've already probably all done anyway. But one of the first things out of the gate was that is the enrollment study. Chuck, and I know Rich has a question too. Yeah, what, one thing regarding the enrollment study is they want to be particular that it was based on the districts of the elementary school or included that as well, because I believe that data doesn't exist right now, or we don't get that with the, the NASDAQ survey uh, or projection. So okay. we'll make sure that's included. But the second part of that, and Vin, I, or Arnett, you can correct me, I'm just here, but we have to go, we have to request the proposal for that separately, correct? Do you need to do anything with the committee to get that going, or what's, what's the procedure for actually getting somebody to do this study? All right. I I'll answer that and, and Arnett can add. So there's um, the way the town charter works in terms of procurement. Um, if we're hiring a professional, like a design firm, as an example, or a firm that specializes in enrollment studies or does that as part of their business, you know, we can, under the town charter, get quotes for that and negotiate with the vendors and make a selection on that basis. Another option is to put it out to uh, an RFP or bid, which is gonna, it's just gonna take longer. You know, my thinking on this, because there's not a lot of firms that do these enrollment studies. You know, we, we did talk to Colliers about this. You know, they, they work with NASDAQ uh, and Mylone and McBroom has a, you know, a part of their firm that specializes in enrollment studies. So we can certainly get quotes from those two if the committee you know, were agreeable to approach it that way. Um, Urbanomics did the study that was done as part of the first, well, as part of the facility master plan that was released in 2018. We can get a quote from them as well. But you know, Collier's has worked extensively with NESDEC and Mylona McBroom. So that's the quickest way to do it, but it becomes a, you know, a comfort question for the for the committee um, and I would think that we could get you know a, a request for quotes is, is pretty easy that could do that by email and it'll take you know just a day to, to draft some specs I would run them past Collier's at this point um, and we could get the proposals and, and introduce those to the committee for review or okay. RFP I personally like option one but open it for anybody to have comments. If there's a way for us to move it forward and get some quotes in, I think that would be great. I'm not option sure we one. would, I'm not sure we'd get any, any much more if we went out to, you know, did the other, it would just take longer. I think so. Okay. Yeah, Vin, so if you can do that, that would be great. We would, that would be appreciated. Okay. Consider it done. Then, you know, the only th other thing I want to add is, 
that Collier's, you know, they do have the information that we provided from the last enrollment right. study that we did. They got the updated NASDAQ information. Uh, Jeff Solon had sent that to them. But as Chuck was saying, what we get annually from NASDAQ is not school by school for elementary. It's all lumped right. together. Middle and high school, we do get. So um, I'll get the proposals going and we'll come back to the committee. And you know, we, I don't think we need to wait till the next meeting. If, yeah. As I have information, I could you know, make sure it gets figured out. Great, agreed, terrific. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other comments or questions in terms of Collier's getting up and running? Henry? Yes. I just wanted to Rich. clarify one thing. When we <clears throat> voted earlier, we said we were voting for phase one. Correct. The $41,000 talks about uh, pre-referendum phase one and two. So that, I just don't want there to be any confusion later on that. Um, confusion. Yes, I'm, I was going by, I guess it's proposal one. Okay. As it's chunked out, the 41,000. Okay. As long, long as it's clear to everyone that yep. it includes that 41,000. Correct. Thanks, Rich. <clears throat> okay, terrific. That's so glad that's done. Good. Um, all right. So the next thing we had on the agenda, um, again, this goes to how best we can help um, get some direction to Colliers. Obviously, they're going to be looking at things and coming back to us with their recommendations. But Renee and I put together kind of just a one-sheeter for discussion tonight um, that kind of summarized some of the things that we felt we've heard since the beginning um, for all the conversations. Um, in terms of wanting to have, be ready to give Collier's some direction versus just saying, here's a bunch of information, come back to us with what you think, you know, let's kind of help direct them. So um, if you didn't have a chance to take a look at it, it only came out today, you know, we can walk through it, um, but just wanted to try to use it as a kickoff from a conversation standpoint. Um, we are at this point keeping all things on the table, obviously. So, you know, whether we're talking about renovations, renovate to new, putting additions on, New construction, obviously we're gonna talk budget at the end of this meeting. A lot of that will be dictated by, by, by cost, obviously, but we're certainly at this starting phase trying to keep everything on the table. We know the plan's gonna be phased over multiple years, um, multiple referendums most likely, um, and that we do have to consider you know, the bond capacity credit rating of the town as we put the whole plan together. So those are kind of the assumptions that um, Renee and I started with. Um, then we wanted to think about options for what would be considered, you know, the main project, because there's been some conversation I know amongst us about, you know, leading with the high school versus leading with the middle school, right? So um, in terms of leading with the high school, the high school is, you know, probably the most visible facility in our town. Um, it is widely used by the community at large, both the facility and the grounds. There's certainly um, a big educational impact to having a new high school. We know the need is there, um, but there's also a positive impact on the community at large. And there may be a presumption of that having the largest benefit from a property value standpoint in town. So, um, you know, you look at the high school, there's a definite need there, and obviously it reaches well beyond the school community. You look at leading with the middle school, um, it would allow us to achieve the educational goal of a six to eight school. The other really positive thing about leading with the middle school is it potentially has more ripple effects um, on other buildings in town, right? And that, therefore more long-term cost savings. So um, if we were to do a middle school that allowed, that went a six to eight, um, we would be able to move kindergarten from Darcy into Doolittle, right? Um, there's been talk about, you know, putting the pre-K and birth to three program in Highland. So there you have a, an empty building in Darcy to either close or repurpose. Um, moving the sixth grade out, an enrollment study will tell us this, but if we get the sixth grade out of the elementary school, it raises the question of, do we need three elementary schools? Do we need four elementary schools? So it just has um, a lot more of a domino effect, the middle school than the high school. So that's maybe a, a pro, um, but the high school being a bit more visible. Um, if we move Darcy, if we move Dodd rather to a different location, then we have the opportunity to repurpose Dodd potentially as an elementary school, potentially as the new alternative high school. You know, we have those options to look at it from a facility. Um, and we know we had talked um, about all of our existing buildings and, and footprints that the Doolittle campus was potentially one that had the space for such a building. Um, so wanted to keep that, didn't want to lose that 
part of the, that's a consideration. And then as already mentioned tonight, we have you know high priority consideration around Humiston and the need to close that school, but the need to find a, a good facility for the alternative high school, closing Chapman, but again, that is based on improvements or additions to other buildings and same with Darcy. So um, we just wanted to start the conversation. Um, and I know that was kind of a lot to digest without the piece of paper in front of you, um, but want to get thoughts because we do think it's going to be helpful for Collier to know where we're coming from. And that doesn't mean we may not look at two plans. You know, there doesn't have to be one silver bullet plan right out of the gate, um, but it would be nice to know where this group kind of leans in terms of priorities so that we can kind of focus our efforts, especially given our, our tight timeline. And Renee, I don't know if you want to add anything to that as well, since we kind of collaborated on putting that together. Yeah, no, I think it will be key to um to give them direction from the start because there's there's a lot of paper out there of different reports that have been put together over the years and um we are engaging them on a on a uh time and material assignment that they'll be, they will be billing us for their time spent and if we give them a good head start i think it will be more efficient for the committee and for the town to achieve our goals so i think it's important to review this document and make sure we're all in agreement that this is the path that as a committee we want to take forward. And I, you know, so I welcome anyone's thoughts on all of that or welcome thoughts on feelings in terms of the high school, I don't want to say versus the middle school, but in a way high school versus middle school in terms of what big project we may, we might put in the lead from a priority standpoint. There you go. Okay, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> I'm not real good at this. Um, I think that Collier could help us with this, though. In in you know what would a high school cost? What would a middle school cost? Uh, some of the the notes that I made to myself about uh, a middle school at this point, if uh, in, in the timeline, I think is probably three to five years down the road by the time we get it designed. Uh, get it bonded, get it to the state to see what our reimbursement cost will be. I think that a lot of the people that we're asking to vote on this project, their kids are in the elementary school now, will actually be in the high school by the time a new middle school would come to fruition. Whereas if we built a new high school, the kid, the people in the elementary schools, their their children will be going into the high school about the time that the high school is completed. Uh, just a thought, just a, a thought. Um, if you do a high school, you then can renovate the high school. And this is just a thought that I have given. Uh, number one, you could then renovate it and put Dodd or put your middle school at Cheshire High School. You have a, a four class high school. You could turn it into a three class middle school. You could also move your Board of Ed offices there. You could move your alternate high school there. And you could certainly move your, um, oh, the Darcy programs that are, that are at Darcy right now, minus the kindergarten. By, by closing Darcy, by closing Humiston, and by having more room, you wouldn't be affecting, you'd move the kids from the high school to the new high school, redo the high school for the middle school, take the middle school or Dodd's kids there, and then you could use Dodd as a, you know, as a temporary elementary school while you're redoing whether it be Doolittle or uh, Norton or Highland. Um, and, and, and again, maybe maybe this, uh, by condensing Darcy and Humiston, that, that, that's one thing the state really likes to look at when they're talking about building a new school, that they have the ability to close other schools and save money in that respect. So, um, you know, I would, I would be more inclined 
uh, you know, to vote for a high school. It would be a little bit more expensive, I think, than a middle school. But again, I think the voters would see that they're, it's something their children will be using. And uh, the middle school also has already been, uh, you know, defeated uh, at referendum in no. the past. Well, yes. for the yes. last years, yes. years, years ago, yes. <laughs> But not the okay. last round. So it I'm never old. got that far. So I'm old. I think when we talk about the last middle school plan, people think of the plan three years ago. Oh, no. No, not at all. No, this is going back to the yep. 80s. Okay. All right. Good. Anybody else have comments? Andrew? Um, you know, I think everyone on this committee has a different opinion as to where we start. And from talking to folks in town, I think everyone in town kind of has a different opinion as to where to start. So perhaps maybe with the kickoff meeting with Colliers, we go into them and give them a set amount of time, say a week, and they come to the committee at their first kickoff meeting with what they think their plan could be um, to best address the facilities, and then we could start the debate from there. Because I think we could go around to every single one of us, and we all could yeah. start somewhere else. I mean, I hear a lot of people, they want to start in the elementary schools because a lot of the kids are in the schools and would like smaller class sizes, and they would like their kids to be in Doolittle, say, with kindergarten. So it's just my opinion. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. Tony? Yeah, I, I'm not going to say where I want to start because I want to hear everybody's opinions. And I, I don't think we're going to solve this tonight, but we're going to keep talking about this. One of the things that might help is if we had all the variables um, or all the data updated. So the, the last plan, some of the things that helped that uh, board get to a decision was after the studies were done, after the costs were estimated for renovate in place, renovate as new, build as new, and different configurations, and then ultimately what the educational goals were, right? Then we looked at all that, all that data and decided on what was decided on, which at this point is not really relevant. I think if Collier's can help us get refreshed information, whether it's the enrollment study projections, um, certainly revised costs. Um, and my perception was when they were giving their presentation, I got a sense that the way they were talking, they were looking at, you know, from a percent of renovating all in place. This isn't thought about, again, so I think having those costs and the different pros and cons, that's going to help too. I'm curious what they say, but I do agree. We can't just um, run off and about some kind of direction, but. I think we need those variables refreshed and see where that puts us. Um, as far as the program at the middle school, I, I think it was uh, Jen brought up earlier in, in the meeting that you know, some of the elementary schools don't have science labs. In fact, Norton, I think, is one of them. And with the middle school, there will be dedicated science, world language, math lab, et cetera. Now, if we didn't do a new middle school in a six-way configuration, who's to say that we couldn't make those options available at all the schools? So, uh, where I'm going with this is, I still think those educational specs are applicable in some capacity if we don't start with a middle school. Um, you know, yep. was, the program is needed anywhere anyway. So, um, but curious to we land on this. Yep, good points. Thank you. Chuck. I would uh, say that, you know, I think we have a direction to give to Colliers by saying we need to know if it's best to start with a high school right. or if it's best to start with a middle school. I mean, let them kind of guide us down which path is going to be the best based on facts, not necessarily our opinion of what we think needs to be out there. You know, you kind of touched on the ripple effect that the um, doing a middle school might have, but what's the ripple effect that a new high school might have? Right. You know, if we build a new high school on another site, then we have a giant school in the middle of town that may be used for the middle school, like Matt was saying. So I think if we go to them on both, I think we can all agree that we need a new one of the other first, right? right. And have them kind of guide us as to which one's the, the best way to go based on, you know, data. Yep. Good. Um, Ann, and then I have Sylvia too. So one thing just to keep in mind with, if you're talking about uh, rebuilding high school versus middle school is the high school could actually be built on, it's a, on the site that it's on. Um, the middle school, if you want to include a sixth grade 
cannot be built on the site where it is. Right. So just, just to keep in mind. Yep, yep good point. Um, Sylvia? Let me unmute. I, like Matt, I'm having trouble with finding that. Um, I think what you're saying is absolutely right. We need to look at both of those options. But I do, my experience in having visited the other schools and hearing from the way other people did it was um, oftentimes when they started with the project, the consultant that they hired, whether it was Collier's or another consultant, in their experience in working with the reimbursement rates in the, in the state, on a couple of occasions um, after working the numbers, found that it was better to do one or the other option. And that's to Chuck's point, it's mm -hmm. the facts that it, the cost to perhaps refurbish or rebuild will be significantly different data seeking to do rebuilding perhaps and be would be much more favorable and we get a better financial deal if we rebuilt than we think we would. So I think that's one of the reasons we're hiring them is to use some of that expertise and experience to help us make that distinction as to which would be the best choice to start with. Um, I don't think we should just assume that we should, we as a committee should choose the first option. I agree whoever it was, um, Renee or Chuck or whatever, let's meet with Colliers and say, these are the two things that we feel are the places to start to help us to make that decision. Yep, nope, agreed. Rich. You're still muted. Yeah, there you I know. Go. I'm talking away and only listening to myself <laughs> as usual. Uh, when we went and visited some of the other school districts, uh, the renovations that they did often were done uh, by taking a piece of the old building, building a new section, and then ripping off pieces. Um, I'm thinking of what you know, Matt has in terms of converting the old high school. It would be interesting to see, first of all, I don't know whether there's space there to put both the high school, a new high school, and our present high school on the same site. I'm thinking of North Haven, which did that. And then they were able to share a lot of facilities. Um, but also secondly, whether if you kept the old high school and converted it into a middle school, would you need that entire footprint or would you take pieces of it off? Um, I'm thinking particularly you've got that brand new section in the front. Um, it would be difficult, I think, to say to the, to the uh, community that you know we're going to uh, just destroy that after it was built, uh, what, 20 years ago. So I'm just thinking, it, you know, as, as we talk with Colliers, I don't know whether it's even possible to build a new high school on the same site and do a renovation of the old high school, downsizing it to a six through eight middle school. But it definitely would be a much nicer facility for the middle school with a gymnasium, a couple of gyms maybe, uh, an auditorium, uh, some of the facilities they don't have now. Right. Yep. Agreed. Um, any other comments? I'm going to cut anybody off. Tony. The, the, I think the theme that Chuck brought up, I, and everyone's is saying, is that no, no matter where you start, it's it doesn't end with the, just that one school because whether you do the middle school or the high school or another school, there's going to be a ripple effect, and if you do the high school, then what happens to the other schools? Because we all know we all need something to be done. You start at the middle school, what's that ripple ripple effect in terms of maintenance and et cetera? And more importantly, what do the cost structures look for each one of those options? So I, I agree with everyone. Let's get the facts. But I, I am comfortable in saying, telling, helping colleagues say, look, let's start with the middle school or high school. Give us your thoughts on that and go from there. So. Like that. Okay. Great. Matt. Just one more point. Anyone that has driven down South Main Street for the last two months has found that there is positively no traffic. And I think most of the traffic that is caused in Cheshire between the uh, 7 15 and 8 o'clock time frame is caused by the high school or the crossing light uh, activated uh, from parking to the high school. Um, and I think that th that could be a, a positive 
you, you would eliminate students driving there and things like that. But I, I just wanted to mention the, uh, the traffic being way down and how nice it is to drive through Cheshire now. Yeah, good point, good point. Um, all right, great. I don't see any other hands. All right, then the, la this, the last thing that we had on the agenda wasn't much of a discussion item. It was just a note. Um, you know, we talk about Collier's being able to update us and let us know different costs. Um, I, I personally like to get the group's feeling, feel it's also time that we ask the town to tell us, um, to give us some type of budget parameters as we keep talking about the need to develop a fiscally responsible plan. I don't know what that means exactly. And, and we may, and the town council may not know quite yet either, but I think we need at least um, a couple of options to say maybe a bunch of different spending levels and what the impact of each of those spending levels may be or could be on the town. So um, I just think we're only going to get so far without being able to really um, go forward without better understanding. And I know these are crazy times to understand budgets, um, but I think we at least need to, you know, ask the, the town to, to start thinking about that. Um, so really want, want to get your thoughts, on, especially those on Board of Ed, Town Council, who are closer to our, our town budgets and this process. I see Peter unmuted himself, so I know he has something to say. It was, it was simply to get in first and nominate uh, <laughs> Sylvia and Don to answer that question. <laughs> when he puts himself back on mute, he wasn't kidding. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to answer it. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, we're, we're, this budget has been extremely difficult this yeah. year, and it, and what we're seeing for the next two or three years, it's going to get worse. Um, our our debt service is going up in the next couple of years, so it's going to be tight. It's going to be tight, and I think the best thing to do is I think we're going to have to bring. Uh, I mean, Sean could probably answer this better, but Jim Jaska's going to have to look at scenarios of. You know how much are we going to have to bond, and how much is it going to cost us, and how we, how can we keep our 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 rating as best as we can? Um, will can we keep, continue keeping that AAA rating? I don't know. If depending on how much we're going to have to bond, but I think that's where we're going to have to get our our financial people involved to to give us some guidance of saying, okay, we bond this much. This is what it's going to cost. This is where we're going to be, and um, uh, I mean, but I think Sean might be able to answer a better, best of all, because take take the town council people, he knows all the finance people, so let him do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just add, um, and I think in some ways the timing, uh, you know, I guess inadvertently is, is appropriate because while we'll be adopting an operating budget next week, um, this year we did present both an operating and capital budget uh, at the same time. Of course, that was a, both of those were uh, prepared in February, long before we really experience what we're experiencing now. So um, the council, as much as we're wrapping up operating budget next week, uh, we're going to be hopefully diving right into the capital budget a week or two later. Um, I see everybody's really enthusiastic about that. But um, so June, you know, I, I, it's going to be an appropriate time because we have some things on there that, frankly, uh, I, you know, recommended um, before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So I think we're going to have to look at the five-year plan. Uh, how do those things fit into our, our new world summer essential uh, safety issues and, and regular, you know, road paving that we're going to have to do, but some of them we may decide um, in light of what's going on, have to have to take a back seat to other priorities and how school modernization effort uh, fits in. I mean, I referenced it in the plan. I uh, didn't put a number in, but we referenced that that's a major consideration for uh, the, the five-year plan. So we have to we have to figure out, and I think the council will start that really in the coming weeks, um, just actually looking at the project. So uh, it's all going to inform, and we're certainly, we stand ready to, to continue to provide uh, financial uh, information where appropriate, and um, even reflecting the new rates, I think Matt referenced earlier, uh, you know, if we, if we, I think the rates are where they are now, we don't know exactly where they're going to go, but they're certainly far lower than we estimated in some of our cost projections. So um, we may be able to incorporate some of that with our financial advisor and try to project uh, maybe have some savings there too. So um, we'll be we'll be starting up in earnest uh, in the coming weeks. Sylvia, can I add to that? I agree with all of everything that you said, and my concern about putting any questions out to the public as to what they're prepared to spend should not be too premature. I think we need to have a 
somewhat of a plan based on what we have just discussed, all the financial parameters that the town can afford. You put it out um, as a as maybe a, just like now, we can't decide whether we want a junior high or a high school. If you put it out as a public question to say, everybody come to a meeting and tell us what you can spend, I think that you will dilute the message and you need to come up with a plan that's supported by the financial wherewithal of the town and maybe a couple of choices, but, but I think to put it out too early can maybe dilute the project. Now you financial people may disagree with me on that situation, but I think we need to, if we're going to get this project done, we need to have the buy-in of the people who are going to be using it. And in order to do that, we need to tell them what the, what the benefits for them are going to be and what the long-term benefits of the town are going to be and their, to their tax uh, to their tax situation to their property values and until you can give them the costs of what that's going to be i think you're opening it up too early if you if you go to them too soon i'm all about being transparent but i think it needs to be done with some great deal of thought. And after having sat now, how many nights have we all been together, you gentlemen that have been here, um, so late at night trying to figure out what to do with the budget to be responsible about making sure we can do all these things. We really have to stay focused on that in order to come up with the best way for this plan to go forward. And I don't believe any of us are saying that it shouldn't go forward by any means. We just have to make sure that we know the best way to do that. So, um, Anne Marie, I, I'd agree with with Sylvia. And to, to Don's point, just looking at the at the next four years, Don talked about the the debt service number. It goes up seven hundred and fifty thousand, then to eight eight seventy eight to nine fifteen to nine forty nine. That's the next four years without anything else happening you're looking at those sort of increases that we're, um, that we're tackling. That being said, the, the last proposal that was on the table last night was to look at doing some smoothing over the next three years to knock those numbers down. Um, after that four year period, and if we were to do some sort of a new building or even if it's a, a refurbished building, um, the debt service probably is four years out, and after the after those four years of large numbers, the number drops to eighty two thousand for the you know for an increase in in year five. So I, I think the town council has to be prudent on what they do in a five year capital budget. Um, continue to look at it on a yearly basis. Um, there is a little breathing room down the road, which is probably when the bond would be uh, would be hitting for some sort of uh, school modernization plan. Um, so, you know, to to pull a number, I, I I don't think any of us can, you know, can fall on a number that says, you know, this number will work. But I'm in I'm in Sylvia's camp with that that says. I think we do the best we can. We put together a great plan. We learn how to, you know, to sell it and to to PR it and prove the worth of it. And and the number, you know, rests on its own laurels. Okay. Sony, I see you also unmuted. So go ahead. Yeah. So um, I uh, agree and somewhat disagree. I, I'm not in favor. I don't think anyone's saying that we got to put a number out there and get the property to tell us what to spend. We're nowhere near that. But we, we do have to have a number to work with. Even this preliminary, it's one of the first thing Collier is going to ask for is great. You have all these ideas and options. And we'll certainly, you know, but hey, give us an idea, a range of what's going to work for the town. Now, we know it's not going to be a hard number. Things change. But I would recommend, you know, the Sean Town Council and Jim, you know, do enough work to do already is, based on the variables and parameters you have now, based on the four-year projection you're looking at, you know, what is palatable from their point of view for the fiscal? doesn't mean that's what we're going to go to the public with, but at least gives this committee some idea, you know, and, and as we go through this process and a couple of real numbers, you know, if, if, if the ideal 
solution we pick is just a few dollars more and we go back to the town council and say, hey, for a few dollars more, you get all this value and that's something, you know, I know we're not there yet. So we can't limit the hard numbers, but we got to have some idea. Uh, and so we brought, brought, and, and Pete brought a great um, thing that we got to focus on. And I read that in Sylvia's email a few weeks ago, which is, you know, one of the, the pitfalls of the last time around was there was literally no public input uh, from the point in time that the board presented a plan. There was never an opportunity to even discuss with the public. So we never got a chance to, A, get in front of them and pitch the plan and pitch the values. And get. We absolutely have to do that this time around because, and, you know, to get there, I agree with the team is we got to have numbers. We got to have good details. We got to show that we spend the time vetting this and, you know, that we can defend it and show them the value. So I don't want to rush that part uh, yep. at all. Uh, but I agree to, to get their input now on numbers. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. And I think folks on the call probably most don't know that the last four or five weeks plus the town council has been vetting the current budget process. The board's been you know, helping them because one of their goals is to try to do a zero mill rate increase next year, which is, that's how bad things are projected to be. And not because of the town, because of COVID. So to go out there now and say, hey, what can we afford? And there's a 10% employment in Cheshire. It's not going to be a good response. I think it's all right. premature. But right. when the time comes, we should be able to defend whatever number that is and prove to the town that we've put the work in to justify it. So don't want to rush that part. But no, and I, cool. I didn't mean to imply that's what I meant. No, no, no. I, I did not mean that at all. No, I nobody guess. is. I don't think <laughs> okay. anyone's that, uh, that I brave at this point. Where I'm coming from is we, let's say, let's say we can't afford new construction at all. Like the reality is, let's say we can't even afford to even consider that. It would be good to know that earlier in the process than later in the process, right? So I, knowing it's not a hard number, it would help to have some kind of ranges or something that we could give colliers because if new construction is like out of the question because it's just gonna be too expensive and it's gonna put too much of a burden on the town, then. I don't even want to, you know, I don't want to go there and invest the time in, in putting a plan and trying to sell something that we know up front is too crazy. So that was more of where I'm coming from in terms of, yes, we want to look at every option, new construction, renovation, whatever, but budget may dictate what really is the, the path we have to go down. And, and I, we'd rather have some of that budget reality sooner than too late. I, I have this vision in the back of my head that Jim Jaskot's like this artificial computing intelligence machine <laughs> sitting in his office. So I'm envisioning that as Collier's comes up with estimates of various options on numbers we can fit a gym and just spits out yes, no, maybe. You know, it's, <laughs> so there's a little bit of feedback. Well, I mean facetious, yep. but I think that's gonna be part of the process okay. is my opinion, but that's a good yep. point. No, and I agree with you. I'm not saying you're trying to uh yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Uh, Don, and I think we're yeah, I just had a um, because I think some of this is going to have to be predicated on what Collier comes back to us about, you know, uh, new construction and and what percentage we're going to get back from the state versus uh, Reno and all that because they're going to have to guide us with some of that in order for us to say okay, well, if we is it going to be more feasible for us to to do a new construction because we're getting more back from the state versus that. But, but there, I mean, right now, who knows what the state is actually going to be doing. Um, I mean, the state is in as bad a shape as anybody. And, um, you know, I think, I think they're going to have to give us some guidance before we can just give you a number too. I think, I think, I don't think we can just say, Hey, you know, here's, here's a hundred million dollars. And, and let's, that's what we're going to do because I think we're going to have to figure out, you know, how much are we getting back? How much? I think some of those questions are going to have to be answered before, you know, anybody can start throwing out numbers. Okay. Sounds good, Renee. You're muted. <laughs> I have two places where to unmute. Um, you know, I was going to say that um, the, the other aspect that the budget will reveal is how do we split this project in different phases and different referendums? Because as we learned on the 2017 study, in order to take care of um, all the issues that we have, both uh, improvements and program issues, we need a large uh, capital budget. But how do we split that in different referendums 
in in different projects. I think that's what the biggest input will be from knowing what what those financial capabilities are. Okay, good point. <clears throat> okay, any other comments? Let's see, oh, Matt. Again, another uh, key component to this is what are we going to save by closing the schools and, and not having to maintain them and, uh, and, and maybe even to the point of uh, taking them and um, selling them. Yeah, um, everything's on the table. You know, and, and that's, that's why I think the numbers for our, for our maintenance and, and electric and heat and snow plowing per school is extremely important so that we know we can say to the public, listen, we're going to save $2 million per school. We're closing two schools. We're saving $4 million. That's going to be an annual savings. And, and that might make this a little more palatable to people in, in, mm -hmm. in the long run, you know, over a, a 20 year bonding period. Yep. No, that's definitely a factor. Ann. Yeah. I, I'm wondering if, um, can the town just put a for sale sign out in front of Humiston and let's see <laughs> if we can get, if we can get some bites. We know we have to move out of there. Um, even if we're going to rent administrative space somewhere is it's, it's that building is probably worth something to somebody. And I'm just wondering, can we, can we see, can we put out some feelers, uh, see if, if that building is sellable? Just a thought. Matt. And Marie. Yes. I, I put a little bit of thought into that, Ann, and I think you're, you're right. Um, but I think what you do is, is, is in, you know, the rumors for, a hundred years have been that that has to be maintained as some sort of educational facility. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, there are Humistons that are still that still live in this town today, and I really don't think they care one way or another. But that being said, I think that's a pretty simple uh, situation. You go you go to St. Peter's, you go to Temple Beth David, and you go to Cheshire Academy, and ask them for a, a proposal as to any interest in, in what, uh, you know, what they might offer for those buildings, uh, knowing that it would have to be some sort of educational uh, situation. There's two abutters, or there's actually, you know, basically three abutters to, to see if there's any interest that way. That, that would be the, the simplest way of doing it. But, uh, you know, Ben would know best. It's got to cost us a fortune to... Uh, to maintain it, to heat it, and to light it, and just to get the white elephant off our back, uh, it might be worth a dollar. Jeff, you're gonna have to you want... you're gonna have to pay to give it away. <laughs> I, well, that's what I'm saying. I'm not kidding. Vin, <laughs> last at last estimate in that school, Vincent and Jeff. I mean, three years ago, we were ready to walk away from it to rent space and get out of there because it's not compliant. And you know, quite frankly, I think I'm gonna say some video, but there's issues there that are, I think the last time we checked, it was over two million dollars rectified. Isn't to historical bring it to a building, level though. that someone could utilize it in a proper education setting. It's worth considering, but uh, Ann and Matt have a good, good point. Ben, what is our, I, I know, I should know this, we've talked about this so many times. What is the town or the boards, um, what can we do with that building? I, 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 can I don't think we that. own it. I know we're allowed to use it. Do you know what the restrictions are? Yeah, we worked through Mirth Kalina a few years back. I have the actual, like a photocopy of the handwritten town notes when the money was actually donated. In working with Martha Kalina, they indicated that it would be for the lifetime of the building. And that building has far exceeded a reasonable lifetime. Uh, so, you know, what we would need to do is just go to the state and they would, you know, clear that. Uh, we haven't done that, uh, it hasn't been a priority. But, you know, certainly we could initiate that at some point. Yeah, the issue, I mean, the thing that we would have to do, if we wanted to abandon Humiston at this point, we'd have to find new space, you know, so there would be a cost to get new space. And, you know, the, the new space would be for Humiston School um, and for the central office staff. I mean, it certainly would be 
more expensive than the current maintenance costs of Humiston right now? Because we uh, presumably we'd have to do leasehold improvements and make an investment, but eventually we have to do it. So, you know, as Jeff said, we, we know what the next step is if we wanted to try and get the Humiston building undone because it's supposed to be used for educational purposes. It can be undone though. But we kind of need a roadmap of, okay, yep. what do we want to do? And then we could take that step. Okay. Oh, Colliers has their work cut out for us, for them, don't they? <laughs> um, <of> okay. <laughs> um, any comments, any other comments, questions? I don't see any. We are at the end of our agenda. Um, made good progress. I think it'll be great to get Colliers obviously up and running um, as quickly as possible and get that enrollment study, um, you know, information and that piece of it going as well. Um, I think that'll get us some, some good traction. So um, there isn't anything else I would entertain um, a motion, Peter. Actually, Anna. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I had a, a quick, quick question. I, yep. I know Sylvia at the beginning of the meeting brought up the timeline topic. I think we touched upon a little bit. Was there intent to have further discussion on it or are we good for now? I didn't want to over glance over that. Yeah, so do you feel we address? I mean, I think the reality is we, um, you know, I think we need to get Collier's going and then we can see where the, you know, what that means from our timeline standpoint. I think, you know, the fact is if we've approved proposal one, you know, there's not a set time against that. I think we'll try to move it quickly as, you know, forward as quickly as we can. And, and I would look to Collier's to actually develop a, a more specific timeline for every step of this process. But Sylvia, um, you know, welcome your thoughts as well. Yeah, and only quickly, because we all want to be done with this for the for the evening. But um, I, I really think we need to be careful. Having been on the council now for 10 years and been involved in many different building projects, I see the folly in trying to push things through very quickly. If we absolutely, I, I will say it again, we have to sell this project, whatever we decide, however it works. If we try to take something to referendum in November, it is my feeling that it is going to be overridden by all of the local politics and the national po political landscape right now that people are going to be in lots of different camps in this, in this election, and we will not have the time to get the public informed well enough, have the facts out there and disseminated well enough for them to give us the right answer. And if they put it, if they vote it down, then we have just shot ourselves in the foot. I would rather see we let it go. And even if we have to pay a little extra to have a separate referendum in pick it, February, March, April, sometime in the spring when we've had time to get the facts together, and to be able to sell the project, I think we have a far greater chance of success in getting the project. And a difference of two or three months after this COVID stuff is minor in the general 10-year project. So I would rather yep. not rush it. And that's that's just where I'm at. So um, yep. I'd like to I 100% I agree. I mentioned it at our last call, um, you know, my feelings on the timeline. I am... Uh, less concerned about the November referendums, to be perfectly honest, and more focused on let's just continue moving forward with everything we need to do and where we land is where we land. Uh, I don't wanna slow things down. I want us to continue to you know, keep pressing forward as aggressively as we can. Um, but that November referendum, understanding the back timeline behind that to me um, is a fairly, um, you know, potentially unrealistic deadline. Um, and so I just think we need to be focused on what the task we have at hand to move it forward and wherever we land from a timing standpoint, we'll bring it forward as, as soon as it makes sense to do so. Makes sense to me. Okay. All right. Any other comments, questions? Are we good? All right. Peter. Have a great holiday weekend. I move we adjourn. <laughs> Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night. Good to see everybody. Enjoy your long weekend. Good night.